Hello and welcome. I'm Pastor Thomas Wilder. Welcome to Bethel's Bible Study. It's such a delight for me to share the Word of God with you. There's so much that God has in His Word for us. So let's get ready to study. Get your pads, your pencils, whatever it is you use to take notes, and let's get into God's Word. Well, good evening. Welcome to Bethel. This is Pastor Thomas Wilder, as you heard from the introduction. And we are continuing to study the book of Job. Today we are in Job chapter 8. So if you'll turn your Bibles there, we'll go ahead and uh, get started after I pray. Job chapter 8. Uh, as we normally do, we'll read through the whole chapter, come back and talk about it verse by verse. But let's begin with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you now for your word. Thank you for opening up your word to us, for giving us insight and understanding of your word. And as we see, as we hear, as we understand, then give us wisdom that we may know how to apply it in our lives. For our good and for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's turn to Job chapter 8, and I'm going to read it. I have... Uh, everything I need, and you're here, so let's not go through those preliminaries. Let's get right into it. Job chapter 8, let's begin at verse number 1. Then answered, let me, well, let me introduce it for you first. Uh, Bildad is rebuking Job again. This is the second time that he's going to go and talk to Job. And Bildad is going to go, he's going to use uh, some illustrations about God. He's going to go to the world of nature. And then he's going to come back to God to say, Job, you are sinning. You, you, you had to have sinned somewhere in order for these things to be occurring in your life. And, and so that's the gist of what we will be talking about today. Bill, Bill Dad is rebuking Job again and telling him that he had to have sinned. Now, let's read through it, and then we'll go back and talk about it. Then answered Bill Dad the Shuhite and said, how long will thou speak these words? And how long shall the words of thy mouth be like a strong wind? Doth God pervert judgment? Or doth the Almighty pervert justice? If thy children have sinned against him, and he have cast them away for their transgression, if ye would seek unto God the times, and make thy supplication to the Almighty, if thou were pure and upright, surely now he would awake for thee, and make the habitation of thy righteousness prosperous. Though thy beginning was small, yet thy latter end shall greatly increase. For inquire, I pray thee, of the former age, and prepare thyself to the search of the fathers. We are, for we are, but of yesterday, and know nothing, because our days upon earth are a shadow. Shall not they teach thee, and tell thee, in other words, out of their heart? Can the rush grow up without mire? Can the flag grow without water? Whilst it is yet in the greenness and, cut and not cut down, it withereth because any, because before any other herb. Excuse me. So are the paths of all that forget God, and the hypocrite's hope shall perish, whose hope shall be cut off, and whose trust shall be a spider's web. How shall lean, he shall lean upon his house, but it shall not stand. He shall hold it fast, but it shall not endure. He is green before the sun, and his branch shooteth forth in his garden. His roots are wrapped around the heap, about the heap, and see, see it the places, the place of stones. If he destroy him from his place, then it shall deny him, saying, I have not seen thee. Behold, this is the joy of his way, and out of the earth shall others grow. Behold, God will not cast away a perfect man, neither will he help the evildoers, till he fill his mouth with laughing and his lips with rejoicing. They that hate thee shall be clothed with shame, and the dwelling place of the wicked shall come to naught. Okay, so Job now is being rebuked uh, for the second time by Bildad. And so Bildad is going to go through, and he's going to talk a number of, of, from a number of approaches as to why Job is going through what he is going through. So Bildad, again, is disputing with, with Job. Uh, he begins by asking Job a very serious question, and that is this. Job, how long are you going to let this mess come out of your mouth? 
You keep declaring that you're innocent. You keep declaring you've done nothing wrong. How long are you going to keep this up? How long are you going to let, I'm going to use my words here, hot air, a strong wind, a blast of wind, verse 2, come out of your mouth? How long will you speak these things? How long shall the words of thy mouth be like a strong wind? Gushes of hot air, gushes of strong wind with no substance to it. How long are you going to, how long are you going to allow that? And then he asked a very, very deep question because it is true, number one, what he asked, but then also, number two, he has never seen anything other than righteous people being blessed, wicked people being um, condemned, damned, going through torment. So, so here's what he comes out with in verse number three. Does God pervert, the word pervert, avath, means rest, falsify, overthrow, subvert, turn upside down. Does God turn upside down judgment? Or does the Almighty One, does El Shaddai, does God pervert justice? Now, the answer to that question, as I said, is absolutely not. God does not pervert judgment, nor does he pervert justice. God does allow things to go on for a while, as he said in the Old Testament about the Amorites, until their cup of iniquity is full. So there are times, the Bible in the New Testament says, that, that God will suffer long with them, God will avenge his very elect, though he suffer long with him. There are times that there may be divine delays. God told Abraham, I'm going to allow your people to be slaves for 400 years. He knew the exact time, but then he said, in 400 years, I'm going to come back and I'm going to do something. There are times, though God does not rest or pervert, God does not throw upside down judgment, there are times that God does allow things until he decides to deal with them. And so that's what's going on here. So God does not pervert judgment. The Almighty does not pervert justice. Justice is that the righteous are blessed. Justice, justice is the wicked are persecuted. Judgment is that those who do right will be honored by God. Judgment is those who do not do right will not be honored by God. God. Now, I want us to look at the book of Psalm, Psalms 99. I want to look at verse 4. Psalm 99, and let's look at verse number 4. Psalm 99, and we're looking at verse number 4. Just a, just a verse to help us to remember that God does not pervert judgment or justice. God is just. God is righteous. Let's look at Psalm 99, verse 4. The king's strength also loveth judgment. The king's strength, being God, thou dost establish equity, thou executed judgment and righteousness in Jacob or in Israel. So God does not pervert justice. God does not turn upside down uh, judgment. God is righteous in all that he does. I want to look at one other verse. Let's look at the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 14. Daniel 9, verse 14. I'm going to read verses 13 and 14. Daniel 9, verses 13 and 14. This is Daniel as he is speaking. As it is written in the law of Moses... All this evil is come upon us, yet may we not our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand by truth. Therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he does." for we obey not his voice. So Daniel said, God watched it. God allowed it. God knew it was coming. We did the wrong, 
But yet God, even in his mercy, watched over it and would not allow it to go further than it needed to go. And so uh, here he's saying God is righteous. God is righteous in all that he does. We obeyed not his voice. God allowed us to be punished. And that's why we are where we are. Now, Bildad says to Job, God does, no, God does not do wrong. If you are going through problems, if you're going through troubles, it's because you're the one that did wrong. You're the one that sinned, and God is allowing upon you the things that you deserve. He gives one specific example in verse 4. He says, if thy children sin against God, and God casts away, cast them away for their transgression, he answered the question, is that not justice? Is that not the right thing to do? If your, sin, if your children sinned and God allowed them to be thrown away, or not thrown away, if God allowed them to be destroyed, then is that not justice? The answer is yes, it is justice. But we know that from early in Job, it was Satan who was doing all this. It was Satan who was causing all this trouble. It was not God. But Bildad's trying to convince Job that the, the same idea uh, is carrying the same thing that Satan had at the beginning, that, that God had placed a hedge around Job and that if Job were really righteous, he would be protected. But now Bildad suggests that because his, of his children's sin, God took them away, took away his hand and he allowed them to be destroyed. But from the beginning, Bildad and Satan himself said, God, you protected Job. You protected him. But if you let me touch him, then I'll do some things that will cause him to curse you. And that's when God allowed it. Now, verse 5. Bildad comes with a second statement of truth. If you seek him frequently, if you seek him urgently, if you seek him with everything you have, if you allow God's spirit, I'm adding this from a New Testament standpoint, if you allow God's spirit to bring the conviction and if you will submit to the conviction that God is bringing, if you will repent, then God will hear you. And he uses a phrase here that uh, later on, he'll say, God will wake up for you. But if you see God, if you make your supplications to him, God will hear you. So Job stopped saying, I'm righteous, I'm righteous, I'm righteous, I'm righteous. I've done nothing wrong. I've done nothing wrong. I've done nothing wrong. If you'll repent and if you'll seek the face of God, then God will hear you. Verse 7, if you were pure, if you were upright like you say you are, then it would not appear that God is sleeping on you when you're going through this. It would be that God would make your habitation prosperous. The theme, again, as we go through this, as we go through Job, you'll see it quite frequently, that the righteous are prosperous, that the righteous have things go well with them, that the righteous do not suffer, that the righteous always have everything they need because that's what they saw in their time frame. The righteous prosper and the wicked suffer. Now, this is, one, this is the third if that Job is confronted with. The first if uh, deals with the fact that his children had sinned. The second if deals with the fact that if you seek God. The third if deals with the fact that if you were morally pure, if you were innocent as you say, then God would awake for you. God will wake up out of his sleep. God will come to the point where he will rescue you. He will shake himself out of his slumber and he will say, Job is calling. I got to go see about Job. And God would make your habitation prosperous instead of you having everything that you previously owned taken away from you. That's what Bildad is saying. Verse 7, Bildad states another statement of truth. This statement of truth is this. So, so Bildad is telling the truth. He is telling the truth, but the truth here is applied 
in the wrong circumstance. He is telling the truth. Everything he's saying is true. If you were a sinner, if your children sin, then God would deal with them. He's saying God is not a God that perverts judgment or justice. He is saying if you seek God, God would hear you. He is saying if you appear and upright, then God would awaken for you. And here's this next statement of truth. Verse number seven. Even though you had a small beginning, yet your latter end would see, I'm going to add this word, tremendous increase if you are righteous. Because everyone knows from Bildad's perspective, the righteous always increase. God's hand will be upon you. God's hand will cause everything you do to increase. Remember Psalm 1. Uh, Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor seated in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. Uh, bringeth forth his fruit in his season. Uh, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. Whatever he does shall prosper. Verse 4, chapter 1, or, or Psalm 1, verse 4. Whatever he does prosper. Bildad understood that. And it is a statement of truth that though you were small, Zechariah 4, 10 says, who is he that dis or do not despise the day of small beginnings? Jesus said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, which is the smallest among seeds, that you would say to this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea, and it shall obey you. Because with God, little can be much. The book of Proverbs says, a little that a righteous man have is greater than great revenues of the wicked. Why is that important? Because God breathes on and causes to prosper. God breathes life into what the righteous have. And build that is correct. If you were righteous, if you were pure, God would bless you. God would prosper your habitation. God would take your small beginnings and make it bigger. Now, am I saying that money is or, or increase is the sole determinant of whether you're righteous? Absolutely not. But I do believe, and I believe Scripture bears me out, that if you are walking with God, something is going to increase. Your faith is going to increase. Your love is going to increase. Your understanding is going to increase. Your spirituality is going to increase. Your finances may increase. Whatever other thing, may, your anointing may increase. You cannot walk with God and not experience increase. It may not be financial because for some of us, money is not everything. Some of us love peace of mind. We love peace of mind. Uh, we, had a, we had a brother here. He, he's dead now, God rest his soul. His name was Brother Reuben Davis. Brother Reuben Davis would always talk about the importance of peace of mind, how valuable peace of mind is. And it is true. Peace of mind, Proverbs again, better is a little where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. Better is a dinner of herbs, uh, more accurately, where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. It is better, he says, to dwell in the corner of a housetop than to deal with a brawling woman, a brawling person, excuse me. <laughs> the, the scripture does say brawling woman, but I say brawling person, in a wide house. It's true. Very true. Whatever, whatever, let me back up. When you walk with God, there is some aspect of your life that's going to increase. Be it your faith, your love walk, your understanding, your wisdom, your counsel, your knowledge, uh, your anointing, something is going to increase. There is no way, no way, and I feel very sure about this. I am emphatic. There is no way that you can walk with God or we can walk with God and something not increase. You're going to increase somewhere because God is a God of increase. Bildad tells Job in verse 7 of chapter 8, even if your beginnings were small, if you were righteous, 
If you are walking with God, you see great increase. Verse 8. Then Bildad changes on Job. He started out talking about the nature of God and how if you are righteous, from, from the nature of God, these things would happen. Now he's going to begin to shift gears. And he's going to say, okay, now that I have made my argument about the nature of God, let's look at everyday life. And he begins with nature in verse 8. For inquire, I pray thee, of the former age, and prepare thyself to the search of their fathers. Now, he, I'm sorry, he, he goes to tradition before he goes with nature. He said, ask the former generations. Look at the well-established, long-held pieces of wisdom. Ask the advice of those who have investigated, learned, and researched these things before you were ever born. Ask the old people, in other words. Ask the ancients. Have you ever seen a man or a woman that followed God who did not have increase, who was not, uh, God did not answer their prayers, whose children were not blessed, whose habitation was not blessed up until that time? No, they had never seen that. Never seen that. They had seen God bless, 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 bless. Romans chapter 15, verse 4 tells us, whatsoever things were written before time were written for our learning. They were written so that we would know the wisdom of the ancients, the wisdom of the aged. Build that appeals to Job. Don't just listen to me. Listen to the old people. They'll tell you, look at conventional wisdom. It'll tell you, look at God's wisdom. It'll tell you that God increases the righteous. It will tell you that God blesses the habitation and prospers those who are upright. It will tell you that when you pray, if you're right with God, God will hear you. All of these testify, Joe. I'm telling you about the nature of God. It testifies that something's wrong in your life. Now, if you don't believe me from God's perspective, just look at life. Look at your own life. Look, look at your father and your grandfather. Look at the elders. Have you ever seen any of them go through this kind of stuff that you're going through? If you were righteous, Job, then life would be good for you. So he appeals now to the ancients. I want us to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I want to begin at verse number 6. 1 Corinthians 10, let's begin at verse number 6. 1 Corinthians 10, verse number 6. We're talking about learning from those who have gone before us, learning the wisdom, learning from their mistakes. Job is being admonished here to listen uh, and reflect back on the wisdom of the aged. Inquire of those who've gone on before us. Inquire of the older people. Uh, search your fathers. Search the case of your fathers. All right, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're looking at verses 6 through 10. Now, we're reading these because they're going to show us that people do the same things. The nature of man has not changed. The way he exemplifies his nature has changed. Now, uh, if, you, if you were into pornography, God forbid, if you were in pornography, you used to have to go and uh, go to a drugstore uh, or go to one of these uh, X-rated houses to look at stuff. Now, you can look at it on your phone, I hear. Same sin. Just a different way to bring it out. All right, 1 Corinthians 10, let's begin at verse 6. Now, these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and 20,000. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of destroyers. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Did I just read that twice? Now all these things happened unto them 
as in examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. He writes, Paul writes, these are the things that cause them to be overthrown, thrown in the wilderness. Now, these are the things that will also cause you to be overthrown. And, and these are the things where people do. They commit fornication. They commit idolatry. They commit murmuring. They, they, they lust after evil things. The nature of man is not changed. Job is admonished. Job is encouraged to look at the ancients, look at the elders. All right, let's go down to verse number nine. For we are but of yesterday and know nothing. All that we know basically has already been known. Ecclesiastes says that which has been has already been. There's nobody who can say, behold a new thing. That which has been has already been. Build that shares that same sentiment. Our days upon earth are as a shadow. We listen to the advice of the elders. We take their counsel. We hold their teachings dear. We are of yesterday or belonging to yesterday because... Uh, because of that, we want to listen to the advice of those who've gone on before us. We don't have time to discover everything ourselves. We need to listen to those who have gone, who have searched it out, who've experienced it, so that we can make our shadow upon earth last as long as we can and be as productive as it can be. Verse 9, because our days on earth are as a shadow. Verse 10, because they are of a shadow, shall not they teach thee? Now, to be, to be very accurate, but also to, to help in understanding, I'm going to read it the way we should read it. Verse 9 is what we call parenthetical. In other words, it's in parenthesis. Let me read verse 8 and 10 to complete the thought. For inquire, I pray thee, of the former age, and prepare thyself to the search of their fathers. Shall not they, our fathers, teach thee and tell thee, in other words, out of their hearts? So verse 10 then goes back, and it should be connected to verse 8. The fathers should teach you. The fathers will tell you. The fathers will utter words out of their hearts. They've been through this. They have been through the things that we are experiencing. And they're telling you from their experience, these things are true. Job then has to understand, according to, to Bildad, that his wisdom is not new. But in this case, what Job experienced was new. It was, from what we understand, one of the first times that a person who is truly righteous suffers. You don't see that before. This is the first time. So there was something new in the situation. So the angels, he said, the older people will teach you. They will teach you out of their hearts. They will teach you what they know. They will utter words out of their heart. They will tell you the truth. And we want that to be a part of your life. So he, he goes, talks about God. God is telling you there's something wrong. The old people are telling you something wrong. And now he's going to go through the third, third thing, and that is nature itself. Let's look now at verses 11 and 12. Can the rush, which is a type of plant, grow up without mire? The answer is no. Can the flag, flagon or something like that, grow without water? The answer is no. We would consider that similar to a cane. Uh, we used to have cane poles where I grew up from. We cut down and used them as fishing poles. So can they grow up without marsh? The answer is no. Can this uh, flag grow up without water? The answer is no. Verse 12, he continues, while it is yet, while the flag and the rush are yet green and not cut down, if the water disappears, it will wither. The, the environment that is conducive for its growth, if that is changed, if that is altered, if it is taken away, then they die. And he begins to make a point. Verse 
13. So are the paths of all that forget God, and the hypocrite's hope shall perish. Just like this tree cannot grow without water, just like this other reed cannot grow without water, so a person who forgets God cannot prosper. Reading between the lines. And Job, you're not prospering because you forgot God. Somewhere in all, and he said earlier, somewhere in all this going around shouting hallelujah and praise the Lord and glory be to God, somewhere there was some hypocrisy in your life. Somewhere you were doing something on the slide. Somewhere you were on the down low. And now it's just caught up with you because the conditions that were necessary for, you, for prosperity are not there. And one of the conditions is a personal integrity and a personal righteousness. And because there is not personal integrity and personal righteousness, you're suffering. Nature itself tells you, if there's not an environment for something, it's going to dry up. There's not an environment for righteousness in your life. And, for, and because of that, you're perishing. You're dying. Verse 13, the paths of all that forget God, the hypocrites' hope shall die. Why will it die? Because they have forgotten God. Just like these other plants, these other little bushes cannot grow without the conditions. A person cannot grow in an environment of hypocrisy or forgetting God. Verse 14, he continues. The hope of the wicked shall be cut off. And that which he trusts in will be as, adding a word, fragile, easily broken, easily torn down as a spider's web. You can take your hand and just wipe away a spider's web. Sometimes, if you want to get close enough to it, you can probably blow hard, on, blow hard enough on it that the spider's web will go away. That's the way Bildad describes Job's life. It's like a spider's web, Job. There's no righteousness. There's no stability. There's nothing to keep it where it should be. And therefore, it's going away. It is blowing away. He continues. Verse 15, the wicked, the one that forgets God, will lean upon his house, but he will not stand. He'll try to hold it fast, but it will not endure. So the same thing that Jesus said, a person who builds his house upon the rock is a person who fears me, who hears my word, who does it, who builds his house upon a rock, Rain to sin, floods came, winds blow, will not destroy the house. But if that house is built upon the sand, if it is not built on my word and righteousness from my word, it will die. It will perish. You can lean on the side of it, and instead of the house standing up, it just sort of crumbles down, and you fall. It will be like a spider's web. He paints a very vivid picture of what happens to the wicked. What happens to those that forget God? They will not prosper. They will not stand while they're being green. While they're still green, he said, back up in verse 12. While it's being green and not cut down, it's going to wither like any other herb because it's not there. And even though you say you're righteous, you're withering on the vine because there's not the condu conditions of righteousness there. Verse 16, he is green before the sun. His branch shooteth forth in his garden. This is the wicked. His roots may be wrapped in a heap. He seeth the place of stones. If he destroy him from his place, then it shall deny him, saying, I have not seen thee. All right, let's look at what Job is saying here. So the wicked, and, and, and the psalmist says, I've seen the wicked as a green bay tree. He's still using examples from nature, and he is saying that even though the wicked may be green before the sun, even though their branch may shoot out in the garden, even though they may have lots of roots, 
and, and they may be in a heap and they may see the stone or, or, or wrap around a stone. When God destroys him and he is gone, the place where he was will say, I don't know what happened to him. He's gone. Because when you forget God, you die, somebody else come in your place, and for the most part, you're forgotten. The book of Proverbs says, the name of the righteous will be in everlasting remembrance, but the name of the wicked shall rot. Nobody will even know you, he said. You'll go, you'll die, and nobody even remembers that you were here. And when you ask somebody, was he here? He said, nope, don't even know him. Didn't even know him. You die, you perish, nobody considers you. Turn to Psalm 37. And let's look at verse 35. Psalm 37, verse 35. Bildad does a good job in describing to Job the temporalness of the wicked, the temporalness of those who forget God, the temporary condition, condition of those who may be prospering for a little while, but because they're not rooted in righteousness, because they're not rooted in God, they will die. Proverb, not Proverb, Psalm 37 we want to look at verse 35. I have, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I might have to back up. I saw some other things. Um, let's go back to, it's a good way to go back, but we're not going to go back very far. Uh, mm, 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 mm. Let's start at verse 32. I could actually go back a whole lot further, but we're just going to start at verse 32. Psalm 37, we'll look at verse 32. And what he's doing is comparing the righteous and the wicked. Here is, the part of, here is part of his comparison. The wicked watcheth the righteous and seeketh to slay him. The Lord will not leave the wicked in the hands of I mean, the righteous in the hands of the wicked, nor will he condemn the righteous when he is judged. Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. Here's, here's the verse. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. Here's the other part. Yet he passed away, and lo, he was not found. Yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. Now, Job doesn't say the exact same thing, but he does say they were there. They were green. Seemed like they prospered. Seemed like they were doing well. Seemed like they, they were rooted. But where are they? And you ask the ground where they were. They said, I hadn't seen him. I don't know where he is. Because they perished so quickly. And that's what Bildad is inferring happened to Job. You were... Prospering, you were growing, you were a green bay tree. But then, Job, that little fake Christianity you had, it dried up. That little fake stuff you were putting out, God saw through it. And now, since we know, he said earlier, since we know that God does not, verse 3, God does not pervert judgment and God does not pervert justice, then we know you're getting what you deserve. Because the righteous... The righteous, the righteous are blessed and the wicked are destroyed. And when they are destroyed, you look for them, but you can't find them. Psalm says, I look for them, couldn't find them because they perished. They went away. All right, let's move on. Let's go back to Job. All right, so we're at Job chapter uh, 8. We're, we're looking at the wicked. Bildad is building his case, and he's building a pretty strong case. God is not unrighteous. Okay? God is not unrighteous, Hebrews says, to forget your work and labor of love and that you minister to the saints and do, do minister. It would be unrighteous 
for God to forget your work and labor of love. It would not be right. It would not be just. So God is not unrighteous, so he won't forget. And now we move on. He says, but the wicked, they're the ones that they're going to go through a lot of trouble. So if God, if, if, if God destroyed the wicked and the hypocrite and those that forget God, then God is going to bless the righteous. If God is the only one that can destroy, then you're being destroyed because of God. That's what Job is being accused of. All right, let's look at verse 19. We're going to slow down a bit right here because there's some good stuff in here that I want to give to you. Behold, this is the joy of his way, and out of the earth others grow. Let's look at Psalm 113, verse 7. Psalm 113, verse 7. Psalm 113, verse number 7. This is where he speaks of God. God raises up the poor out of the dust and lifts the needy out of the dung hill. This is the joy of his way. And out of the earth shall others grow. God, two, two ways we, we need to understand this. First, this is how God operates in the earth. This is God's joy. The wicked are there. God cuts them down. And God puts the righteous in his stead. Those who abuse the poor, God cuts them down. And God puts the righteous in his stead. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him will God teach in the way that he should choose. Children's children are the heritage. That's not right. Um, the, the verse goes, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Okay? So, so, so the point is that God puts down one and lifts up another. Okay? God puts down one and God lifts up another. That's God's joy in the earth, that God replaces the wicked with the evil, okay? God replaces the wicked with the evil. Now, I want to look at one other verse. Let's see if I can find that very quickly here on my notes. Okay. Um, it, it comes from Psalm. So I can't find it in my notes, but let me, let me see if I can go from memory here. Let's look at Psalm, and I want to say it is... Psalm 73. Let's see how well the old memory is kicking in. And if it's not, I am going to cheat and look on my computer and see if I can find it. I think it's Psalm 73. Let's look and see. Do, 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 do. It looks like it is. I'm scanning very quickly to see if I see the verse. All right, let me, that's not it. Uh, that does talk about the wicked and how they think they're being promoted, but they are not. Um, there's a particular verse that I want. And so let me see if I can look it up very quickly. Psalm 75, not 73. Memo to file. It is Psalm 75, not Psalm 73. All right, let's look at Psalm 75. So the joy of the Lord is to put down the wicked and to promote the righteous. Psalm 75, and I want to look now at verse number 6. Okay, something not right here. 
Oh, I'm looking at the wrong verse. Okay, I'm looking at Psalm 76, verse 6. It didn't look right. Psalm 75, verse 6. Are we there? Hopefully we are. It says this. For a promotion cometh from the east. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He put it down one and set it up another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red, it is full of mixture, and he poured out of the same. But the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth, shall wring them out and drink them. Now, what the psalmist is telling us is the same thing that Job is testifying to. The joy of the Lord is to take down the wicked and put the righteous in his place. That's the joy of the Lord. All right, now, let's go back to Job chapter 8. And now I want to sit down a little bit further on these last three verses. Job chapter uh, 8, we're going to look at these last few verses. We're going to spend, we only have about, looks like uh, about 14 minutes. So we will spend that 14 minutes dealing with these verses. Job chapter 8, we want to look at verses 21, 20, 21, and 22. All right, so, so we've already understood now. We've, we've, we've understood from God, about God's nature. We've understood about the ancients. We've understood about nature. And now Bill Dad is coming full circle, and he's going to come back around to God. He begins this case. And he ends this case with God, which is where everything should start. We begin with God and we end with God. We begin by praying, finding out what God's will is. We seek all the information we can, but then we go back, God, what do you say? We begin with God and end with God. That's what Bildad does. So in verse 20, he says, Behold, God will not cast away a perfect man, neither will he help the evildoers. Bildad goes back to one fundamental thing. And that is, we know God is righteous. We know that. Job, we know God is righteous. God will not. God never has. God does not cast down a righteous man. We know that. We may not understand everything that's going with you, but we go back to what we know. We know the character of God. God is righteous. God is not unjust. God is not unrighteous. God does not pervert justice. God does not pervert judgment. And, and, and because of that, Bildad presses in on Job again. God does not do wrong. We know that. God will not cast away a perfect man. Neither will God help evildoers. We know those things. God is righteous. Now, I, I want to just build your faith up a little bit in this. I, I want to make sure that we understand this principle, and particularly if you're going through a trial. Realize this. God is not going to do wrong. God is not going to leave you by yourself. God is not going to forsake you. Even if you do wrong. Last Sunday, we were, we were in Bible, we were, actually we were in church in, in Sunday school. And I'm in the couples class. I do invite you out Sunday morning, 9 o'clock, to the couples class if you're married or newlywed or, or about to get married. I want to invite you out. We, we're studying uh, the book of Genesis. But we look at Abimelech. And Abimelech had taken Sarah, Abraham's husband, into his harem. And he hadn't gotten around to her yet, but I guess it was in his plan that at some point he would get around to her. And God came to Abimelech and said, Abimelech, you touch this woman, you are a dead man. You are a dead man. And Abimelech said, God, I did this in innocency. I did it. I didn't know. I did it in integrity of my heart. He told me that was his sister. I didn't know. And God said, yeah, I know you didn't know. That's why I did not allow you to touch her. Even though he may not have been a person who followed God as we know persons should, 
He had integrity, and God honored that. God does not cast away a mature, a perfect, or a person with integrity, even though they may not know everything. They may not know all the scriptures, may not know the Romans' road to salvation, may not know how the spiritual gifts operate, may not know the theology of, of Christology, but they know what is right and what is wrong. They know what is, what is of God. And, and God honored that in Abimelech. God will not help evildoers. He will thwart the work of evildoers. God will not forsake his people. God does not cast away his people. Even though Abraham was in the situation where uh, he had willfully said, this is my sister, and, and technically she was. She was a, uh, the, the wife of his father. Why? <laughs> she was the daughter of his father, not of his mother. And, and, and so technically she was his sister, but he was doing it because he was afraid. But God came, and God did not allow even his cowardness did not allow his cowardness to thwart the plan of God. Because God does help righteous people. Let me just give you one verse on that. I, got, I have several in my notes. Um, I'm trying to see which one I want. Let's look at, um, let's see here. Let's just look at Psalm, not Psalm, 1 Samuel 12, 22. I'll look at that one. 1 Samuel 12, 22. I'll tell you what. I opened my Bible and there was something I had underlined in my Bible. And I want to read that first. Let's look at 1 Samuel 2. And we'll look at verse 9. 1 Samuel 2, I know y'all have those electronic Bibles, you got to go back and forth, but it's okay. It's okay, we'll be, you'll be good. 1 Samuel 2, let's look at verse 9. I'll read verses 9 and 10. This is the prayer of Hannah. Actually, it is the song of Hannah. After she had a child, she is just praising God and lifting him up, and then she utters these words, in verse number eight and verse number nine that goes back to what we're talking about in Job, that God will not cast away the perfect, neither will he help the evildoers. Verse nine, he will keep the feet of his saints and the wicked shall be silent in darkness for by strength shall no man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and, sh and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Same thing Bildad has said to Job over and over and over again. God is righteous. God is never going to help an evil man unless he's helping him to store up something to give to the righteous. Now, there, there are numerous cases like that where God helped. Uh, look at Pharaoh. God blessed Pharaoh, and Pharaoh was over the richest nation on the earth, the richest kingdom or empire on the earth at that time. But God stored that in them so that when Israel went out or the Jews went out, God could give that to transfer that wealth into the hands of of righteous people. Now, unfortunately, they went out and made a golden calf out of it. But God did put it in their hands. God did put it in their hands. Now, let's go back to, to, to Job, Job chapter 8. So we've learned that, that Bildad has gone full circle here, and he is coming back to the character of God. And in every adversity, in every circumstance, in every persecution, in every trial, that is what we stand on, the character of God. I know, I know God will work it out. I know God will make a way. I know God will deliver me. Even Job said, uh, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I know him. And, and in your trial, if you learn nothing else, 
One of the things that we need to learn is the character of God, that God is righteous, that God does not do wrong, that God does deliver, that God does uphold, that God is merciful, even in our trials. Bill Dad says in verse 20, God does not cast away a perfect man. And you say you're a perfect man, but yet you're going through this, so something's not right. We know God doesn't cast away a perfect man. All right, let's look at verse 21. I'm going to bridge verse 21 and 22, which is what it, I mean, 20 into 20. I'm going to bridge 21 into 20, which is what it should be. God does not put away, because there is a time when we almost die. God does not put away a righteous man till, until, he has filled his mouth with laughing and his lips with rejoicing. Selah, added by Thomas Wilder. God does not let us, God is not finished with us, let me put it that way, until our mouth is full of laughing. What do we mean by that? We mean that we look at the blessings of God and there's nothing we can do but just laugh and throw up our hands and worship. Because it's, it's more than we ever thought. Why do you think Abraham and Sarah call their son that God had promised laughter? They call him Isaac because God, man, we never thought, we, we never thought this would happen. Look at us. Old man and an old woman having a child. We are laughing. We are laughing with joy. We're laughing with enthusiasm. We're laughing with excitement because, as, as the psalmist said, you have turned for me my morning into dancing. Psalm 30, verse 11. I am laughing. I am rejoicing. I, I think about what you've done, and all I can do is laugh because you've been so good. You have exceeded my expectations, you've exceeded all that I could ask or think. You have exceeded everything that I could have done by myself. You are so magnificent. You are so magnanimous. You are so great. You're so gracious. You're so good. You're so loving. You're so kind. You're so powerful. You are so rich. You've exceeded everything I could have even thought about. <laughs> Man, I tell you what, I could not have even imagined what you've done. And so Bill Dad, and, and I like Bill Dad because he's telling the truth about a lot of things. You look all the way through here. It's truth that, that is misapplied in Job's case, but it's truth nonetheless. He is telling the truth. God does not forsake the righteous. God does not help the evildoers. God is staying with the righteous. God blesses the righteous until he fills his mouth, verse 21, with laughter, and he fills his lips with rejoicing. That, that, that God blesses us such that our mouths are just a well of praise. It's a well of thanksgiving. It's a well of joy. It's a well of, of just worship to God because God has been so good. God has been so righteous. God is not finished, Bill Dad says, until your mouth as a righteous person is full of laughing and your lips are full of joy. If your lips are not full of laughter, if your, your lips are not full of rejoicing, and if your mouth is not full of laughter, God is not finished. He is not finished with you. And don't you lay down and die, and don't you settle for just where you are, because unless you go out of here, I'm, I'm proclaiming this, but I'm proclaiming it by faith, unless you go out of here laughing, shaking your head at the goodness of God, he is not finished with you yet. And don't you give up. Now, here's the last verse in verse in, in chapter 21. Not only does God fill your, your mouth with laughter, the Bible says he satisfied your mouth with good things so that your new is renewed like the eagle. Psalm 103, verse 5. But he says this in verse 22. God is not finished with you yet until they that hate you 
are clothed with shame. And the dwelling place of the wicked comes to nothing. God is not finished with you until those that tried to make you shame are ashamed. And their dwelling comes to nothing. There's nothing left. We read earlier, he said, I saw the wicked as a green bay tree. I saw them, couldn't find them. Where'd they go? Where's the man that was talking all that smack? Where's the man that was talking all that trash? He's gone. Why is he gone? Why is he no more? Because God has destroyed them. God has put them to shame. God has brought upon them the same thing that they wish for us. Now, Job chapter 8 is just full of truth, just full of truth, just chalk full of truth. I believe Bildad is a person of integrity, and he is trying to help Job truly understand, look, what you're dealing with is not from God, and that is true because God was not the author of it. The Bible tells us earlier Satan was. I'm finished with chapter 22. Bible study is over. Thank you so much for watching. I really pray you got something from this because Bill Daddy is just saying that God is righteous. The character of God, the character of, of nature, the character of the ancient all testify that, that, that no good thing does God withhold from those who love him. Thank you so much for watching. God bless you. And may God fill your mouth with laughter. May God fill your lips with rejoicing. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you so much for studying God's Word with us tonight. We believe that God has spoken to you, that God has shown you some things that you've never known before. And as he's given you revelation, now walk in it. Live it out. Show what you have learned by the way you live. And as you do that, God will bless you. God will honor his word in you. God bless you. Thank you again for watching. Good night.